So this is an important thing, and we need to tie in the kidney here because a lot of hypertension is associated with renal problems. If the perfusion to the glomerulus in the afferent arterial is low, the stretch receptors, there are mechanoreceptors that lie in the afferent arterial, will be activated to release renin from granules within the JG cells. This leads to the activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and vasoconstriction of not only the efferent arterial via angiotensin II, but also systemic arteriolar constriction due to angiotensin II. Now, fibromuscular dysplasia is an incredibly high yield disease because it is one of the unique situations in which you can see hypertension in a really young patient secondary to renal problems. Of course, no one knows why this disease occurs, but some publications have come to the conclusion that these patients have a dysfunctional internal elastic lamina. Remember, this separates the intima and the media. Now, let's continue to think about this in a way that allows us to tie in some of the basic fundamentals that test examiners like to test you about. So again, we have our intima, media, and adventitia separated by the internal elastic lamina, external elastic lamina. So this layer here, the internal elastic lamina, is the outermost part of the intima. It separates the intima and the media. What happens in patients with fibromuscular dysplasia? Well, they have a completely disorganized IEL. This means that the underlying muscular media can balloon out, forming an aneurysmal-like dilatation. It balloons into the intima because the internal elastic lamina is weak. That means that flow of blood, because this is our lumen, will be decreased because there's these balloon-like dilatations of the muscular media, occluding the lumen. These little outpouchings or aneurysmal-like dilatations look like the classic string of pearl sign that you will see when you do an angiogram of someone that has fibromuscular dysplasia. As you can see here on the diagram, these are these little balloon-like dilatations we were talking about because the intima is working fine, but the internal elastic lamina is dysfunctional. And there is fibromuscular proliferation of the media causing these little balloon-like pockets that occlude the lumen. This leads to renal hypoperfusion and chronic activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system leading to hypertension. So these little aneurysms are not only the problem for that reason, but they can rupture and heal by scar formation. So when you form scars due to deposition of fibrotic tissue, you also get stenosis of this vessel. So renal artery stenosis due to fibromuscular dysplasia is just like renal artery hypoperfusion for any other reason, meaning that we will decrease the perfusion of the renal parenchyma and therefore chronically activate the RAS system. That's important to know. You've got to know the relationship between the renal and the cardiac response to fibromuscular dysplasia. Now let's continue on with hypertensive emergency. This is defined as 180 over 120, with some evidence of super high pressures in certain organ systems. A favorite one for board examiners is to include the picture of papilledema. So papilla comes from the Latin word for nipple, and edema is Greek for swelling. So papilledema tells us that there's a nipple-like swelling. As you can see in this image, the optic disc kind of looks like a nipple, swollen and edematous. So papilledema is swelling of the optic disc. Remember, the optic disc is just where all of the axons from the eye converge to leave the eyeball. So here's our eyeball. All axons are converging to leave. There are a ton of axons here. Axons are living tissue and they have anterograde and retrograde transmission of proteins and waste. So why do you think hypertensive patients present with papilledema? So we have to understand that the optic nerve is covered by the optic sheath, which is composed of meninges, aka the pia, the arachnoid, and the dura, going in towards that way. So just like the brain, Makes a lot of sense, right? This is no surprise to us because we know that the eyes originate as two outgrowths from the forebrain during organogenesis. If you didn't know that, then some other helpful hints to remember this are that Schwann cells do not cover optic nerve axons, like you would expect if they were peripheral nerves. Oligodendrocytes cover the axons in the eye. In addition to that, once you damage your optic nerves, 
you're permanently blind because unlike peripheral nerves, the optic nerve is a component of the central nervous system and you cannot regenerate CNS neurons, period. So back to the diagram and image here. So if someone has an increased intracranial pressure due to an incredibly high blood pressure, the hydrostatic pressure gradient for CSF to drain from the optic nerve sheath will be obliterated. Remember, this is covered in meninges because it's a continuation of the brain. So CSF must drain from the subarachnoid space back into the brain. If there's a very high intracranial pressure, there is no pressure gradient for the CSF to leave. CSF will engorge this subarachnoid space and it will compress on the central artery and vein, therefore causing necrosis of the cones and rods that are supplied by this central artery. In addition to that, the inability of fluid to leave the optic nerve sheath and back into the cranium due to the high intracranial pressure will cause extravasation of fluid and swelling of the optic disc because of the pressure backs up into these coverings that cover the optic nerve. they all within the optic sheath. So the compression of the central retinal artery leads to infarcts within the tiny arterioles. These are sometimes referred to as flame hemorrhages. And the compression of the central retinal vein backs up pressure into all of the retinal venules that drain into it. As you can see in this picture, the veins are engorged because there's a backup of pressure because there's no gradient to drain back into the cranium. The high intracranial pressure is causing a backup of fluid. This is an emergency because the elevated blood pressure led to an increase in intracranial pressure and this puts the patient at an immediate risk for blindness. So, in the situation of chronic elevated blood pressure, this can lead to arteriolar sclerosis. Also, it can lead to hypertensive retinopathy. So the arterial sclerosis that happens specifically within the retinal vessels can lead to hypertensive retinopathy. And that is the fancy word that ophthalmologists like to throw around. Anytime we compose a higher pressure in our system, we remember whoever's job is to pump it is going to be the first one that gets tested. What am I talking about? The left ventricle. Chronic high pressures always puts work and stress on the left ventricle. It is going to have to work super hard to continue contracting against elevated pressures. Remember that sneaky French guy, Laplace? This is where it comes back and it's applicable here. An increase in left ventricle pressure because it's pumping against a very high systemic pressure, particularly in the ascending aorta. We have to increase the wall thickness to relieve some of that stress. And that also helps us give an increase in contractile force because we're adding sarcomeres in parallel. The analogy I like to use that is if you're playing tug of war, you recruit friends to help you to pull the rope, except that they have to grab the rope in front of you. There's no adding to the back of the line. There's just concentric hypertrophy by adding sarcomeres in parallel. Aortic dissection is another important thing that we need to worry about. It is a very important consequence of the, having the risk factor of hypertension. So again, our aortic arch, if your aorta is getting pounded by high pressures all the time, there's an incredibly high amount of shear force. And this can eventually cause damage to the intima and the media. This sets you up really badly for a weakened aortic wall and potentially dissecting all the way through. And we will go farther in depth as far as aortic dissections go, but this is an important risk factor. Hypertension is a risk factor in addition to Marfan syndrome. Now, what are some signs of hyperlipidemia? These images are directly from your first aid book. They are called xanthomas. So xanthus, this is Greek for yellow, and oma means mass. So already just by the name and image, it is rather obvious that these are yellow little masses of something that an ancient Greek physician discovered in people with hypercholesterolemia. You will only see these in patients with absolutely crazy cholesterol levels, usually in someone with an abnormal genetic profile such as familiar hypercholesterolemia. They have such high levels of cholesterol that there's just an overflow of cholesterol deposition into the papillary dermis, vasculature, the macrophages of the skin. These are called histiocytes in your book. So, the deposition of cholesterol accumulates within the dermis. These macrophages continue to try to phagocytize all of the cholesterol deposited, particularly a LDL. And eventually you have extensions from the papillary dermis into the epidermis. And the yellow coloration of the cholesterol within those macrophages 
Remember, we call those macrophages foam cells because the lipid accumulated within them looks foamy under a microscope because they wash out the lipid during slide preparation. So this yellow coloration of the skin is just an incredibly ridiculous amount of lipid-laden histiocytes accumulating in the epidermis. So let's continue. Here is a great representation of a tendinous xanthoma, where the accumulation is actually in the tendon and it is eventually going to be seen through the skin. Where else can you see these? You can have a corneal arcus. So in addition to presentation of high yield locations such as the Achilles tendon, we can see that examining someone's eyes will give us a great representation of what we need to worry about. So what is this? Not Lord of the Rings, this bad boy here is due to deposition of LDL in the corneal margin. So this creates the presence of a blue ring around the colored part of the eye. When it appears in a young person, you need to worry about hypercholesterolemia as some sort of genetic condition. But when it appears in an older person, it is called an arcus senilis. And senile means old. So arcus means arch, senile means old. Common to see these in old people that have had high levels of cholesterol for a long period of time. Because with old age, especially someone with poor cholesterol control, individuals accumulate deposits everywhere. 